Hi, I'm Eric Siegel and welcome to episode 72 of Eric's Trains. Alright, it is mid-April 2019 and as I hinted at in episode 71, today we're going to kind of get away from the trains and do something completely different. Actually something that has nothing to do with model trains at all, at least directly. You know, many people who collect and operate model trains they don't just do that one thing. They have lots of things they collect and multiple hobbies. And that's certainly the case with me. So while model railroading takes up the majority of my time, I do have several other hobbies and collections. And so today I'm going to share some of those with you and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Now, I'm sure there are going to be some people who are going to whine and complain and say, hey, just stick to the train videos. We don't want to see anything else. Well, if you're in that camp, too bad. I'm going to do it anyway. And you know what? it's okay, just relax. There are plenty of train videos coming in the future. I'm actually in the process of reviewing my first third rail model. It's a Virginian EL2B and it is fantastic. I just got a brand new F3 from Atlas the other day that I'm going to be reviewing and I've got some MTH and Lionel models I'm reviewing as well. I also just started writing product reviews for O-Gage Railroading Magazine. My first two reviews were actually in the last issue and that's been a lot of fun. And because of my connection with O-Gage Railroading Magazine, that's putting me in touch with a lot of people at the companies that make this stuff. And so while Lionel was already sending me some stuff and Atlas was already sending me some stuff, uh, it looks like MTH is going to start sending me some stuff now and Menards is going to start sending me some stuff as well, as well as Third Rail, of course because I've got that Virginian EL2B now. So long story short, there are lots of train videos coming in the near future, but actually this is a good time to sort of get away and do something different because as far as the layout is concerned, there's not a lot of progress going on right now. And there are a couple of reasons for that. There's a lot of stuff in motion right now. I don't want to get into it in this episode. I'll explain it at a later date because a lot of stuff is in motion, but long story short, it means there's going to be a lot of change going on, but in the end, it's going to be really good for the layout and really good for these videos. And that's all coming in the future. But in the short term, the layout is sort of in a little bit of a holding pattern. There's not a lot of progress going on. So this is a good time to sort of take a break and get away and do something a little bit different. So originally, I was going to try to show you all of my other hobbies slash collections in this one episode. But as I started filming it, it got longer and longer. And so now I'm going to be splitting it up into at least two episodes. So in today's episode, we'll take a look at a couple of my other hobbies and collections. And then in episode 73, I'll try to squeeze in the others. And it may have to spill over into episode 74 if necessary. We'll have to see at that point. So I really hope you enjoy this. It's been a lot of fun filming it. So what we're going to do now is leave the layout and go upstairs and get started. All right, so our first stop today is going to be here in my office. I'm going to show you a few things here, and then after that, we'll kind of transition to another room in the house. Now, you've likely seen my office before in previous videos, and you've seen these trains lining the walls everywhere. But something you may not have seen, or if you did see it, you just saw it at a glance, like just now, is the first thing I'm going to show you today, and that is my Zippo collection. Zippos are cigarette lighters. Now, I don't smoke anymore. I used to in high school and college back in the day, but nowadays I enjoy the occasional cigar, but I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. And even when I did, I didn't collect Zippos because I smoked. I collected them because I liked them, and I've been collecting these since I was a kid. And as you can see, I've got a pretty decent little collection here. It's about 150 Zippos or so. And I'm not trying to break any records with this collection, and none of these are especially rare or valuable. I just like collecting them because they look really cool. You know, I shouldn't say they look cool. I should say they are cool because they really are. Zippos have been made by the Zippo company up in Bradford, Pennsylvania since about 1932 or so and they are still made here in the States to this day, which is pretty miraculous, and that's one of the reasons why they're so darn good and so darn bulletproof. I mean, these things are just rock solid. And as you can see, you can get any number of designs on the front of a Zippo, and that's what makes them so collectible, because there are literally thousands upon thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of designs on the front of Zippos. 
So there's no way that any one person could ever have every Zippo that's been made. I don't think anybody does, even the Zippo company itself. But it's fun collecting them. And as you can see, I've got several sub-collections going on here. A lot of them are just of the Zippo logo in some form or fashion. I've got some reproductions of older Zippos from the 30s and 40s. I've got some pretty girls right there. Down here, I've got some Elvis Zippos. I've got some Ford Zippos. I've got a Bell System Zippo. That's pretty cool. Got some John Deere, some Jim Beam, some Jack Daniels, Scrimshaw, Camel Cigarettes, some more Zippo logos. And then I've got a lot of Good Luck Clover Zippos, including the Indiana Jones Zippo. And then over here, this one's not so organized, this case over here, but I've got some random ones. There's a case Zippo down here because Zippo bought the case company a few years back. Right here, these are some used ones that I bought. Some of these are from the Vietnam War and that's sort of a sub-collection within itself. A lot of people collect Zippos from particular war eras. And then up here, there's a couple Lionel Zippos. Now, one cool thing is that a few years ago, Zippo made it so that you could upload an image on their site and they will print the image on a Zippo for you. And so I've got a few of those. There's the Eric's Trains Zippo that you may have seen on my Facebook page. There's one of me and my son. There's one of our family farm up in Wisconsin. There's one of my cat. Got a Black Crows Zippo. That's one of my favorite bands. Zippo also used to make little tape measures for a number of years. They don't make them anymore, but I've got a couple of them here, and one of them is for Conrail. How cool is that? One thing that makes Zippo so easy to collect is that they're not very expensive. Yeah, if you're trying to get a rare, vintage, mint condition Zippo, those can get pricey. But if you're just buying new Zippos like I do most of the time, they range anywhere from 15 to maybe 40 or 50 bucks at most with most of them being right around the $30 range. And so that makes them very easy to pick up. So the way that I do it is that in a given year, I might add one or two Zippos to my collection. If it's a good year, maybe three or four. Sometimes I buy them online and sometimes I find them in gas stations or general stores and stuff like that. Now, the other cool thing about Zippos is that they have a lifetime guarantee. That's not the lifetime of the owner. That's the lifetime of the product. So for example, if you were to go on eBay right now and buy an old broken Zippo that no longer worked, you could send it into Zippo up in Bradford, Pennsylvania, and free of charge, they will put it back into perfect working order. That is a company that stands behind their product. You don't see that a lot these days, but Zippo still does that because they can. These things are built rock solid. They really don't break that often, and when they do, they've got your back. Now, I could talk for the next hour about the history of Zippos and dating Zippos and stuff like that, but if you really want to find out more, just Google Zippos. You'll find lots of pages that are dedicated to collecting these things, and you'll find more information on these things than you could ever want. Now, if you'd like me to do a more detailed video about this collection and about Zippos in general, just let me know in the comments section. I didn't want to bore anybody to death by doing a long, drawn-out explanation in this video, but I'd be happy to do it if you'd like me to. And while I'm not the world's leading expert authority on Zippos, I am pretty knowledgeable. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably a solid 7 or 8. Okay, so the next sort of side hobby collection that I want to show you is to the right and down from the Zippos, and it's right here. This is my Swiss Army Knife collection. Now, when I say Swiss Army Knives, I mean real Swiss Army Knives, not the plethora of knockoff Swiss Army Knife multi-tools that are all over the place. I'm talking about the real things that are made in Switzerland and historically are made by the only two companies that were authorized by the Swiss government to make knives for the Swiss Army. And those two companies were, of course, Victor Inox and Wenger. A few years ago, Victor Inox bought Wenger, so they're kind of one company now. But either way, a real Swiss Army knife has to be made by either Victor Inox or Wenger. Now, you can't see the knives very well the way they are because they're in those cases and they're stacked up. So let me go ahead and take the cases out, and I'll show you what I got. 
So here are my Swiss Army knives, or most of them at least. These are the ones that I buy for collecting purposes. I buy them and I put them in these cases and I pretty much don't use them on a regular basis. I've got a number of other Swiss Army knives that I buy for everyday use. I'll show you those as well in just a little bit. Now, I've been fascinated by Swiss Army knives ever since I was a little kid. I can remember going into hardware stores and places like that when I was young, and they would have the Victoria Knox display with the Swiss Army knives, and they'd have all the tools spread out, and they just looked so cool, and I was totally mesmerized. But of course, they weren't cheap, and so my parents weren't going to spring for an expensive Swiss Army knife for a young kid. And then even a few years later, when I went to summer camp, my parents gave me a Swiss Army knife to take to camp, but even that wasn't a real Swiss Army knife. It was a cheap knockoff that was basically a piece of garbage. It wasn't until I was a little bit older that I took some of my own money and went out and bought my first Swiss Army knife. I guess I was about 14, so that would be right around 1990. And I still have that first Swiss Army knife. I'll show you it in just a little bit when I'm showing you the ones that I have for everyday use. But yeah, I started at 14 and I just never stopped. Now, most of these I've added in my adult years because it was a lot easier to get these once I was grown up and I had a job and I had a little bit of disposable income to spend on something like this. But yeah, I've loved these things ever since I can remember. So as I said, historically, there were two Swiss knife makers that were charged with making knives for the Swiss Army. And those two companies were Victorinox Knox and Wenger. Both companies were formed in the late 1800s with Victorinox Knox being about 10 years older than Wenger. But eventually they struck a compromise and both companies made knives for the Swiss Army. And that agreement lasted all the way up until 2005 when Victorinox acquired Wenger. Now, not all Swiss Army knives like you see here were used by the Swiss Army. The only ones that were actually used by the Swiss Army were called soldier knives and they were a specific design made by both companies for the Swiss Army. I've got some examples of the soldier knives, both old and new, in my collection and I'll try to show you some of those when we go through these cases. Now, the vast majority of my Swiss Army knife collection consists of knives from Victorinox, Knox. And that's simply because when I was younger and I first started collecting these things, Victorinox Knox was the only company that I was aware of that made Swiss Army knives. And you may wonder how that could be, but remember that when I was younger, it was the early 90s and the internet was in its infancy. And so you couldn't just Google who makes Swiss Army knives it really came down to what you were exposed to around where you lived. And around where I lived, it was all Victorinox. Knox. And so I wasn't even aware of the existence of Wenger until much later on. But of course, once I found out about them, I started buying some of their knives. And I can remember that at first it was really weird because, you know, both companies made real Swiss Army knives. Victorinox Knox claimed theirs were the original Swiss Army knives, while Wenger claimed theirs were the genuine Swiss Army knives. And they were very similar and yet very different because of different designs and techniques and so forth. And so when I first started getting Wenger Swiss Army knives, they were kind of like bizarro Swiss Army knives to me. They were really weird. But eventually I got used to them and I got a real appreciation for them because over the years, Wenger had some very cool designs and some really awesome knives. As I said a moment ago, back in 2005, Victoria Knox bought Wenger and they became one company and as such, Victorinox is now the largest maker of pocket knives in the world. Now, what's cool is that when Victorinox bought Wenger, they didn't just get rid of Wenger's designs and so forth, they incorporated them into their own product line. And so in recent years, they've put out some very cool new knives that are sort of a hybrid of the technologies and techniques and designs of both companies. And so from a collecting standpoint, it's been very fun to get some of these new pieces. Now, just like with my Zippo collection, I'm not trying to break any records here, nor am I collecting these because they're exceptionally valuable. I've got one or two pieces that might be a little rare and valuable, but most of them are pretty common. Just like with my trains and the Zippos and the other things you're going to see, I collect these because I like them, not because I think they're valuable or will be valuable. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you want to collect something that's valuable, collect gold and silver. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is go through each of these cases and sort of show you some of the more interesting pieces. And I'll also show you some of my everyday use pieces as well. 
I'm going to go as quickly as I can because I've already been talking for a while and I really don't want to bore you guys any more than I probably already have. But just like with the Zippos, if you'd like me to do some more detailed videos about this collection, just let me know in the comments section and I'll be happy to do that. So in this first case, I've got most of my metal exterior Swiss Army knives with the Alox scales. Uh, there are a few tag-alongs in here, just before anyone says something. These three knives here are not Swiss Army knives. These are made by Case, an American company, which is now owned by Zippo, as I said a few minutes ago. And actually, I should probably get a separate display case for these Case knives, because I've actually got a growing collection of Case knives, and so they really deserve their own display at this point. You'll see more Case knives when we go upstairs. And just so you know, my Swiss Army knife collection is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of knives that I collect. Anyway, so this was my first Wenger Swiss Army knife right here. This is the standard issue soldier knife that was given to Swiss Army soldiers. This was the design that came out in 1961 and it lasted up until 2008 when they came out with a new design. I'll show you that in just a minute, but on the 1961 version, you've got the metal exterior, which looks really nice. You've got a blade, and the year is on one side of the blade. This is 03 for 2003. It's got a punch, or an awl. It's got a can opener with a little screwdriver. And then it's got a bottle opener with a screwdriver. And so this was the standard knife issued to soldiers of the Swiss Army. So the rest of these Alox knives are pretty similar to the soldier knife. They just have either fewer or more tools on them or different tools and they might be a different size like this little guy here. But in general the Alox knives don't have nearly as many cool tools on them as the other knives that Victorinox makes. This is probably about as fancy as they get where this one has a blade another blade. I can't remember off the top of my head what this blade is meant for. Then it's got a bottle opener with a screwdriver, a punch, and then it's got the little saw like that. Pretty cool. Here in the second case we sort of get into the more familiar look for Swiss Army knives. You know, they've got the tweezers and the toothpicks and so forth. Now one of the cool things about Swiss Army knives is that even though they all look very similar, they're actually all very different because each knife has a slightly different set of tools on the inside and oftentimes the tools that they include in each model are geared for a specific purpose and so they will name the knife accordingly for what they think that knife might be used for. So for example, the timekeeper over here has a clock in the handle. Pretty cool. Now the clock is not working right now because the battery is long since dead. And since this knife is just on display all the time, I'm not gonna keep on replacing the battery. But if I did put a new battery in here, it would work. Next to that, we've got the Voyager and the Voyager Lite. These are very similar, except the main difference is that the Voyager Lite has, as its name implies, a light as one of the tools. Now both the Voyager and the Voyager Lite have a digital display on the side. The battery on this one is dead, but I replaced the battery on this one so you could see it in action. And it's got a clock, an alarm, and a timer. So it's called the Voyager, and you know, if you're voyaging, if you're traveling, you might need a clock and an alarm and a timer, and hey, you might need a flashlight if you're traveling as well. All right, here's a cool one. This knife is made by Wenger, and it's called the Mini Grip. And among other tools, it's got a pliers, pretty neat. And then it's got this piece down here, which sticks into the other end and becomes a bit driver. And then if you open up this little compartment here, there's all your bits. <laughs> Pretty neat. And of course, it's got a knife and a bottle opener and a can opener and a saw and a metal file and a couple other things. But yeah, kind of reminds me of a Leatherman in a lot of ways. This is probably a reaction to the Leatherman because I believe this came out in the mid-90s. 
after the Leatherman was already on the market. But that's kind of one of the other neat things about Swiss Army Knives is they're the original multi-tool and they were really around. A lot of them were before the Leatherman and the Gerbers and all that stuff. Not to take anything away from Leatherman and the other brands. They all have their own charm. And in fact, I've got a Leatherman collection. You'll see it when we go upstairs. Are you sensing a pattern here? I like to collect things. These knives over here all have larger locking blades and some of them have some interesting tools. For example, this is the Equestrian and of course it's got a picture of a horse on it. A horse, of course. And its special device is this little gadget which is intended to be used to clean rocks and debris and so forth out of horse hooves. Now, I'm not an Equestrian so I don't know if it actually works well for that. I guess you'd have to ask a horse expert. My guess is it's probably not bad. This is the one-handed parachutist and I guess it's intended to allow you to easily cut yourself free of a parachute or a parachute pack and to help with that it has a seatbelt cutting blade right there. Now it's called one-handed because the main blade has this loop and that allows you to open the blade with one hand. Pretty cool. Now, this is kind of painful for me to do because a few days ago I cut the tip of my thumb and so opening these one-handed blades is a little bit painful, but I wanted to show it to you anyway. And yes, I cut my thumb while preparing for this video. I was cleaning up some of these knives and I nicked my thumb, but you know, sometimes you gotta suffer for your art, right? Above that, we've got the Fireman, and its special tool, just like the Parachutist, is a curved blade for cutting seat belts, which might come in handy if you're a Fireman and you're trying to free trap people from a car. This blue one is called the Helmsman, and it's intended to be used by people who work on the water, and because of that, its special tool is a Marlin Spike. A Marlin Spike is a tool that's used to work with knots and ropes, which might come in handy if you work on a boat. This one here is called the Adventurer and it's a pretty simple knife but it does have a Scout logo on it which is pretty cool. This one's called a Hunter and it's got a little picture of a deer on the front which is kind of cool and you can guess what the intended purpose of this knife is. Its special tool among the others is this little curved blade which they say is to be used for skinning an animal. Now I don't hunt so I don't know how effective this would actually be. I guess you'd actually have to ask a real hunter, but it's still cool nonetheless. This right here is the latest design for the Swiss soldier knife. The silver Alox soldier knife that I showed you a couple minutes ago in the first case, that design debuted in 1961. And so in 2008, it was replaced with this design, which as you can see has a much more modern look and feel to it. This particular knife right here was made in 2009. So the new soldier knife has a large one-handed blade that is partially serrated. On the back side, it's got a Phillips head screwdriver and a punch. Right here, it's got a bottle opener and screwdriver that actually locks in place, which is really nice because if you're using this as a screwdriver or a pry bar or something like that, it's nice that it won't fold back on your hand and hurt you. Right here, it's got the classic can opener and screwdriver, and then it's also got a large saw right there. So that is the new design for the Swiss soldier knife that debuted in 2008. Now what's cool is some other countries use this design as well. I've actually got a German version of the same knife right here. And it's exactly the same, except as you can see, there's a German insignia embossed into the plastic. Pretty cool. Now of the lock blade knives that I've been showing you for the last minute or two, this one right here is kind of the granddaddy of them all. This one's called the WorkChamp XL. And it pretty much has every tool that one of these lock blade knives would have. Has everything I've shown you so far, plus some stuff you haven't seen. This thing is a big old knife. And I actually have a smaller version of this called the WorkChamp that I use for everyday use. I actually use it down on the train layout quite a bit. But yeah, this is the big daddy. And actually, this one right here is a bit of a rarity now because although Victoria Knox still makes the WorkChamp XL, 
they don't make it exactly the same. They actually change the layout of the tools a little bit, and so it's kind of hard to find one of these original layouts. Now, you can still find them every now and then, but it's getting harder and harder. So this is sort of kind of a collector's piece, in my opinion. And, of course, mine is in mint condition. Pretty cool. On to the third case, and this case probably has the most interesting and cool pieces in it. So I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can, but I do want to give each interesting piece the appropriate amount of time. Like I said before, I'm trying really hard not to drag this out, but there are just so many cool pieces that I want to share with you. So even though it may seem like I'm dragging this out, trust me, I am leaving a lot of stuff out, which kind of brings me to another subject. If you're watching this video and you do know a lot about Swiss Army Knives, please don't feel the need to email me or comment about information I may be leaving out or stuff like that because I am intentionally leaving out a lot of historical information and so forth. And like I said, if you'd like a more detailed video at another time, I'll be happy to do it. Just let me know in the comments section. But you don't get a collection of this size without knowing something about what you're collecting, just like with trains and Zippos. And so while I would never claim to be the world's leading authority on Swiss Army knives, I am pretty darn knowledgeable. Again, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably a solid 8. Anyway, we're going to start on this end and kind of work our way forward, and I will try to go as quickly as I can. Up first is a piece called the Mini Champ, and if this one looks a little bit scuffed up or dirty compared to the other knives in these cases, that's because it is. This is actually one of my everyday knives, but I wanted to show it to you because it's also one of my overall favorite Swiss Army knives just in terms of its everyday usability. In fact, if I was going to recommend one Swiss Army knife to get and you don't want to spend a lot of money, I would say get one of these mini champs because they don't cost a lot. They're about $35 or $40. They're small, so they fit easily in your pocket or your purse or what have you. And they've got just about every tool you might want on your average day. So let's check out the tools real quick on the mini champ. Right here is a pair of tweezers. On the other side, there's a ballpoint pen that comes out like that. It's really nice. There's a very nice pair of scissors. Really good for cutting nails. There's a bottle opener and a Phillips head screwdriver. And the Phillips head screwdriver is magnetic, which comes in really handy sometimes. There's the main blade right there. On the other side, there's this tool, which is, they call it a spatula or a scoop, but it's just a little flat piece that comes in handy for all sorts of random tasks. Then there's a flathead screwdriver with a ruler. I don't know if you can see the ruler right there, but it's got both inches and centimeters. Then it's got this interesting tool. This is called an orange peeler, and it's actually really good at peeling oranges. I thought it was kind of silly when I first bought one of these years ago, but when I tried to peel an orange with it, it was fantastic. It made quick work of that orange because the blade is just deep enough to go through the orange skin, but not so deep that it goes into the orange flesh. And this is also good for opening boxes and stuff like that. Then next to that, we've got the secondary blade. They call this the emergency blade. And then on the other end, we've got a nail file and a nail cleaner. So yeah, it's got just just about everything you could want on your average given day. And so for that reason, this is one of the knives that I always carry in my pocket. Either that or a very similar knife called the Midnight Mini Champ, which you'll see in just a second. This one here is called the Swiss Card, and I guess it's supposed to be about the size of a credit card, so you could fit it easily into a purse or maybe a wallet, although it's a bit thick for that. But it's kind of cool. It's got a blade right here. Then right here is a tool that pops out that's got a couple Phillips head screwdrivers and a couple flathead screwdrivers. Right here is a needle. Right here is a nail file and a flathead screwdriver. Got a toothpick right here. A pair of tweezers. And then right here is a ballpoint pen. And then up along the edge here on this side, there's a centimeter ruler. And on the other side, there's an inches ruler. So it's pretty cool. And I believe they also make a version of the Swiss card called the Swiss card light that has a light built into it. But I don't have one of those right now. 
Right here is the Midnight Mini Champ, which is exactly like the Mini Champ that you just saw, except on this side, instead of a pair of tweezers, it's got an LED light. Now, these older versions had a red LED light, which was kind of useless and pointless, and so they corrected that later on, and all the new Midnight Mini Champs have a much brighter white LED light, and I've got one of those that I use for everyday use. Up next, this is what most people picture when they think of a Swiss Army knife. This is the iconic Victorinox Swiss Champ. It's got 33 functions on it, and it's just a great all-around tool to have, and so for that reason, I've actually got three of these. I've got this one in the case, I've got a red one that stays in my computer bag, and then I've got a blue one that stays in my car most of the time, but it also goes out backpacking with me. So because this is such a legendary piece, let's take a look at all 33 functions and hopefully I won't miss any of them or lose count. <laughs> this is what it looks like with all the tools unfolded and as I show you each tool, I'll go ahead and pop them back in. Now this sort of display was what really got me into Swiss Army knives in the first place because as I said when I was a kid and I would go to a hardware store or something like that, they would have these on display and they'd be all unfolded like this and of course the Swiss champ was the king daddy of the knives on display and it just looked so awesome and I was hooked and I knew I had to start collecting these and it was sort of a rite of passage when I got old enough and had enough money to get my own Swiss champ and by the way the price of a Swiss champ is right around $80 or so so they're not super cheap but they're not super expensive either anyway on the back side here we've got a leather punch. Go ahead and pop that back in. Then we've got what's called a parcel hook. Kind of an interesting tool. There's a flathead screwdriver right here. There's a chisel. Then we've got the corkscrew and around the corkscrew or inside of it I should say is a tiny little screwdriver for tiny little screws. This comes in handy all the time. Where the corkscrew goes in, there's a little needle, which comes in very handy. Then, flipping around to the other side, we've got the can opener with a flathead screwdriver. We've got a bottle opener with a flathead screwdriver and a wire stripper. We've got the large blade, we've got the small blade, get that in. This has four tools on it officially, it's a nail cleaner, a nail file, a metal file, and a metal saw. Here's a wood saw right here, got a pair of scissors, right there. This is a inches ruler on one side, a centimeters ruler on the other side, it's a fish scaler, and then a fish hook remover. So that's four tools. Then right here we've got the little wrench with the crimper and the wire cutters. And this wrench is not super powerful, it's not like a Leatherman pliers or anything, but it's handy if you want to bend some metal or grab something. Then we've got a magnifying glass. This is the old style of magnifying glass. And then right here is a Phillips head screwdriver. And then we've got a key ring, which they classify as a tool, which is kind of funny. Then on the outside here, we've got the toothpick. We've got the tweezers. And then we've got a ballpoint pen. And these pens actually work really well. And so those are all the tools on a Victorinox Swiss Champ. Pretty cool. Moving on right here, I've got a couple representatives of the CyberTool line of multi-tools from Victorinox. And what makes these CyberTools interesting is that they have a bit driver piece right here that pops out like that. And then right here is a little caddy that stores your extra bits. Kind of neat. This is the CyberTool light, which has a flashlight on it. There are a few other variations of the CyberTool that I don't have here. I used to have another one, but I lost it several years back to the TSA in an airport. 
And so let that be a lesson to you. If you do have a Swiss Army knife or other multi-tool, make doubly sure that it's in your checked bags and not in your carry-on bags or you will lose a very nice multi-tool. This piece right here is called the Swiss Bit. And what makes it special is that it has a built-in USB thumb drive. And you can actually detach the drive like that. Now, this is one of the earliest versions of the Swiss Bit. And you can tell that because it has a whopping 64 megabytes of storage. So, <laughs> in today's world, it's probably not going to get you very far. Although, you could store a few documents on here and maybe a few songs. The more modern versions of the Swiss Bit do have larger capacities. You can get those in 32 gigabytes and 64 gigabytes and so forth. Now, they did another version of this that had a built-in MP3 player, but those were not made for very long, and because of that, they are very, very hard to find. And so I don't have one of those in my collection yet, but hopefully one of these days I'll be able to add one. This is a cool piece. This is the Victorinox Camp Flame, and it has a built-in butane lighter. So you fill the lighter down there with butane, and then you light it up here. How cool is that? Now, as luck would have it, this does not want to work today. It does work, it has worked in the past. I think it's gummed up, so I'm gonna have to clean it out. But yeah, it's pretty cool, and these were never sold in the US. I had to import it from another country. They are quite hard to find, and if you can find one, they're usually very expensive, usually two or 300 bucks. These last three big ones in the case are expansions on the Swiss Champ, with each one being a little more lavish than the last. So this one right here is the Swiss Champ XLT. It's got about 50 tools on it, including the bit driver from the CyberTool line, as well as a couple other tools you haven't seen yet. And you can still buy these new on Amazon and places like that. They'll run you a little over $200. Now this is the largest variant of these Swiss Champs that I consider practical to carry around on a daily basis, even though I don't carry this one around myself. These next two, in my opinion, are really too big to be practical to carry around every day. I think these are more just for collecting purposes. So this is the Swiss Champ XAVT. And it's got about 80 tools or so. It's got two bit drivers and a flashlight. And then on the side here, it's got the digital display. But it's got more functions than the Voyager tool we've already seen. It's got a clock, an altimeter, a barometer, an alarm clock, a countdown timer, a chronograph, and a thermometer. How cool is that? And then lastly, we've got the king daddy of them all. This is the Swiss Champ XXLT. It's actually got fewer tools than the XAVT, but what makes it special is that it has a built-in lighter like the Camp Flame that you've already seen, except this one actually works. There it is. Now, these were not made for very long. They stopped making them in 2005, and they only made them for a few years. So these are very hard to find, and if you can locate one, they are usually very expensive. Now, I bought this a long time ago when these were still being made, and so while it was expensive then, it was not nearly as expensive as it would be to get one now. So this is definitely something that has gone up in value over the years. All right, so here is the last case, and this case has a lot more of my more recent acquisitions. There's more Wenger designs in this case, as well as a few other interesting pieces. So let's take a quick look. This first piece is an original Wenger knife, and you can tell that because it's got the original Wenger logo on it, as opposed to the Victorinox logo, like most of my knives have. This was called the Tool Chest Plus, and it was sort of Wenger's version of the Swiss Champ. It had a lot of the same tools. But it had a lot of different tools as well, and while some of the tools were the same, they were designed slightly different. So for example, this is what the magnifying glass looks like on the tool chest, and it's got a screwdriver on the end. Unlike the Victorinox, this one has a compass. That's pretty cool. And it has a wrench, but it looks slightly different than Victorinox's wrench. So yeah, it's pretty cool, and I've used this a lot over the years. You can see it's got a lot of scratches and so forth. Now, Victorinox still makes the tool chest. It's part of their line, but they've changed it to a more modern-looking design, so it doesn't look quite like this anymore. 
These two pieces right here are part of the Ranger series of knives that Victorinox has been producing in recent years. And these were brought over from the Wenger product line. And so while they are similar to the other locking blade knives that you've already seen, they're a little bit different. For one thing, when you open up the blade, to put it back in to unlock the blade, you actually press on the cross. And that unlocks the blade so you can fold it back in. That's pretty cool. This one's very similar except it has wood scales on it. And Victorinox has a whole series of knives now that have wooden scales. And I'd like to add more of those to my collection. But again, when the blade opens like that, it locks in place and to unlock it, you press on the Victorinox cross and it goes back in. It's pretty cool. Here's a neat piece. This one's called the nail clip and it's got a tool that folds out like that and you swing it around and you've got yourself a nail clipper and it's actually a pretty good one works very well these two pieces here are part of the evo grip series and these were brought over from wenger when victorinox bought them out and what's nice about these is they have these ergonomic handles that sort of cradle your thumb and fingers they've got a lot of tools that are similar to the wenger tool chest that i showed you a moment ago one of those neat tools is this nut driver piece right here and then this one has a locking blade that locks like that. And then to unlock the blade, you press this big button here and that folds it back in. Well, I haven't shown you one of these yet and I should because I've got a ton of these all over the place. Everybody does. This is probably the most popular model of Swiss Army knife. I'd imagine it's Victorinox's number one seller. And because of that, it's available in about a million different colors and designs but they're all the same on the inside. This model is called the Classic because it is a classic. You've got your scissors, and then you've got a knife and a nail file with a little screwdriver on top. And then up here, you've got a toothpick and a set of tweezers. So yeah, that's your classic Swiss Army knife. This one is for Great Smoky Mountains National Park because I go backpacking there a lot. And this is probably the most affordable Swiss Army knife out there, at least real Swiss Army knife. This one will set you back about 15 bucks or so. The last two pieces I want to show you in these cases are right here. These are both the same model, they're just different colors, but these are not made by Victorinox or Wenger. These are made by another Swiss knife maker called Suiza. Now, while Suiza itself has been around for a long time, I think they're a relative newcomer to the Swiss Army Knife game because on their site they've only got a few select models so far. And this is one of the most basic models they make, if not the most basic. They have some more advanced models and I'm going to be adding some of those in the near future. But these are pretty well made, I have to say. It's got a nice locking blade and you unlock it by pressing the cross. It's got a punch tool right there. On the other side, it's got a corkscrew. And then up top here, it has a set of tweezers. So it's very basic, but very nice. Now, unfortunately, I don't think Suiza is very popular, at least here in the States, because when I first got this one, I got it at REI a few months ago. And at the time, for such a basic model, it was relatively expensive. It was about $35, but I had never seen one, so I went ahead and got it. And then I returned to REI a couple weeks ago and the same knives were now on clearance for $15. So I said, what the heck, and I got another one. So because they're on clearance, I'm guessing they're not selling very well, but I hope they do because competition is always a good thing. Without competition, you get stagnation. And so I hope they do well and give Victorinox some competition because hopefully that will result in some new and exciting models in the years to come. I've got a couple more items to show you, and I promise we're almost done. Now, these are variations on a product from Victorinox called the Swiss Tool. The Swiss Tool came out in the late 90s, and it was Victorinox's response to the Leatherman. Leatherman came out in the 80s, and by the late 90s, they were a serious threat and competitor in the multi-tool market, and for good reason. They make a fantastic product, and so it was inevitable that Victorinox would come out with their own plier-like multi-tool similar to the Leatherman. And so in the late 90s, we got the Swiss Tool. So this was the first Swiss Tool that they came out with. This one's called the Swiss Tool X. And I've had this one for about 15 years. And it has held up beautifully. And I use this thing quite a bit. 
As you can see, it's very sturdy. It's got a good weight to it. It's quite a big tool. The multi-tools, unlike some of the early Leathermans, they're on the outside, which is really nice. And then it's got a big hunk and pliers on the inside, which are very well made. This is an excellent tool. You know, there are thousands of cheap garbage knockoffs of the Leathermen out there. This is not a cheap knockoff. This is a worthy competitor made by a company that makes quality products. And so you could buy one of these instead of a Leatherman and you would never regret it because this is a fantastic tool. Now, of course, there are some things that Leatherman does better than the Swiss tool and there are some things that the Swiss tool does better than the Leatherman. So in the end, whichever one you buy is really a matter of personal preference because they are both fantastic tools and if you watch product reviews that compare the Swiss tool to the Leatherman, most even-handed reviews will say the same thing. You really can't go wrong with either tool. So this was the original, and then later on they came out with a newer version. I got this maybe about six months ago or so. This is the Swiss Tool Spirit, and it's a little bit smaller, but it has these curved handles that give it more of an ergonomic feel, so it's a lot more comfortable in the hand. Quality-wise, it's just as good as the Swiss Tool X. It's a fantastic multi-tool. There's really nothing I can say bad about these things, especially when you compare it to a Leatherman. They're both very high quality products. As I said earlier, I've got a small growing Leatherman collection upstairs, so don't think that I don't appreciate Leatherman tools. I love them. They're awesome, and you'll see them when we go upstairs later on. But the Swiss Tool is a fantastic product as well. This comes with a kit that has a ratchet driver and some bits. It's also got a corkscrew and a mini screwdriver that you can attach. So yeah, this is a great, great multi-tool. Now the Leatherman is a lot easier to find because you can find the Leatherman in every corner hardware store in America, whereas with the Swiss tool, you pretty much have to buy them online because they're not gonna be in a lot of stores that you might be shopping in. But it's still a incredibly high quality product and you really can't go wrong getting one of these. All right, we are down to the final Swiss Army knife of the day. This is it. This is the first Swiss Army knife that I ever bought with my own money. I was about 14 years old, so that would be right around 1990 or so. And this model is called the Tinker. It's a model that is still made today, and this has held up beautifully over the years. It still works just as good as new. Now, somewhere along the line, I broke the plastic scales that are on the outside. And so I eventually had to replace them with these translucent scales. And when I did that, I went ahead and put a scale on the back here that would hold a ballpoint pen. Normally the Tinker does not have a ballpoint pen on board. So this is sort of a modified Tinker. But yeah, this is the one that started it all. All right, so this is where we're gonna stop for today. And I really hope you've enjoyed what you've seen so far. Now coming up in episode 73, we're gonna take a look at some of my musical instruments, and then we'll take a trip upstairs to the top floor of my house and enter what I affectionately call the camping room. And if you think you've seen a lot so far, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I think a lot of you are gonna be blown away by what you see in the camping room. And that's all coming up in episode 73, which I'm in the process of filming right now. So hopefully it'll be out in the next week or two. Now, at this point, I'd like to thank all of my Patreon sponsors. When the credits roll in a second, you'll see a list of all my first class Patreon sponsors. And if you'd like to become a Patreon sponsor, simply go to www.patreon.com slash ericstrains. And also don't forget to like this video and subscribe. For now, that's it. I'm Eric Siegel and I'll see you next time. Now, I've been fascinated with Swiss Army knives ever since I was a little... Nope. Oh. And there's Chessie. <laughs> Screwing up my shot. Hey, Chessie.